Welcome back to Call to Create. I'm your host, Connie Sokol, and I am so delighted. With our guest today, you likely know her, and she is part of a beautiful sisterhood. It's Lauren Walker from Six Sisters. We have her today. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for being with us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We are so thrilled to talk about this because often we have authors and artists and musicians, but we thought this is a creative work. Every time you're working on a meal and creating your life, that is a creative work. So I'm going to give you the official bio rundown, and then we are going to jump into how they actually started 12 years ago with just a sweet little blog, and now it has exploded to millions of viewers. So the Six Sisters are actually a food media company. And that includes Camille, Kristen, Elise, Stephanie, Lauren, and Kendra. And they have a very popular cooking channel. If you haven't seen it, get on there. I have no commission that I receive from this, but I have loved doing the recipes. So fun, so easy. Feels like your best friends next door coming over and helping you. But they actually started the blog sixsisterstuff.com in 2011 as a way to keep in touch after they moved out of the house and started their lives and families on their own. And then in just a few years, like we were saying, it has become one of the top blog sites for women with millions of visitors each month enjoying the family's recipes and stories and tips for running a home. The sisters actually live in California, Texas, and Utah, but stay linked and connected on their cooking. Okay, so let's jump in. So take us back to 2011. You're talking, you're thinking, how did this actually get started? Because you know, families will always talk about doing stuff, but we don't actually make that next step. So how did this all sort of the genesis of this, how did it get started? Of course. So back then, back in 2011, blogs were not a thing. There were like maybe a few DIYers or just a few people starting out on like Blogspot, but it was a really uncommon thing to hear people who were bloggers or who were, were hosting a blog or anything like that. And so I was, I am sister number five. So I am on the younger end of the sisters. On the baby and, side. Yep. Yes. And so when my sisters started getting married and moving away from home, following their husbands to school and having really young children, there was no such thing as unlimited text messages or unlimited minutes. You'd have to wait until I think it was like after 9 p.m. that you could like use free minutes to call. And I mean, we're all across the country, right? So those time zones are not lining up. Phone bills are skyrocketing. We're spending, <laughs> yes, we're spending so much money trying to keep in touch with each other. And our oldest sister, Camille, was like, let's start a blog. She had been kind of reading a blog that had helped her go through a challenging time she had had. And she was like, there's this thing, it's called blogging. You can share stuff. We can put stuff up there to kind of talk to each other. We won't have to call mom every day for like recipes. And that's kind of just how it started. They started posting things they were doing to keep their toddlers entertained and easy recipes, recipes our mom made all growing up and things like that. And I remember I was still in high school when this all started. And I remember sitting in my accounting class. So I have a computer in my class and just reading all of the stuff my sisters were sharing. And so we kept sharing and getting older and I graduated and went to college and kind of started going through some of these same life experiences. And we started noticing we had this little tracker on the side of our website and it would show us where people were coming from. And so typically we all grew up in Utah. And so we would have, you know, our mom and all of us looking at the blog and we had people like on the East coast coming and seeing it. And we were like, Hey, does anyone have any friends? Like, who is this? Like we do maybe a long lost cousin we don't know about, you know? And we realized that we had started the same time as Pinterest and our recipes had been started getting pinned to Pinterest. And so we started growing this audience of people we didn't know, but they were Googling things like mom's chicken casserole or easy recipes and finding our website, which at that time was full of like, I miss you so much. Toddlers are so hard or how do I body train, you know, things like that. And so they were finding these blog posts and stuff. And, and eventually we we put some ads on it and we were like, we're going to take the whole family on a cruise in 10 years with the 50 cents a day that we were making. And, and it kind of just spiraled from there. It was really fun. And we started doing more social media and getting into it. And we started getting feedback of people like, do you have a recipe for this? Or how do I make this? And it kind of just, I don't know, just kind of snowballed into this business that we found ourselves 
running together as sisters. Our mom worked with us, our dad, we had some brothers-in-laws jump in and it was just this business that kind of came out of nowhere unexpectedly, but it's been so fun. And 12 years later, it's something that's providing for all of our families and we just love it. So Oh, that is the Venn diagram, right? Of doing something you love and that you're good at doing and then being able to share and make a difference and contribute with it. That I think is the ultimate desire of every creative, right? I love this. So take us back to, oh my gosh, that's just the language of back, you know, back in the day of when this was not even a thing. Tell us where did the cooking skills come from? Did you all just cook with your mom and you kind of developed as you went? Or are there a couple of sisters that are more, hey, this is my jam and hey, let's all get on board? You know, it's funny because none of us have any professional experience at all. Like one sister, I think, took a cooking class and she shares the story sometimes about how she burned off all of her fingerprints in her college cooking class. Like we are not by any means professional cooks. But we grew up every single day. Our mom had this really long counter. It had six bar stools. And so every day we would sit at the counter and we would just watch our mom cook. And honestly, we weren't really in the kitchen a ton cooking. We weren't really learning how to do stuff. We just watched our mom. And so when we grew up and we got to college and realized, oh my gosh, I now have to cook for myself or get married. And oh my gosh, this this husband is hungry and I only know how to do like mashed potatoes. Like (laughs) it was, it was kind of us learning to cook and learning how to do it just like our mom did it. And so on this website, that's, that's where we would share how to do it. Someone would usually call my mom and be like, what is this recipe? So she would share it with us. We'd put it up on the blog and we would kind of all learn it together. And that's how our recipes I think have become so popular is because even the most novice of cooks can cook them. Even if you've never cooked before, they're so simple and they're so easy and very, very beginner friendly, but delicious and family friendly too. So our mom was kind of the inspiration behind all of it, but it was just us growing up watching her prepare meals for our family. That is such a mama paycheck to all the mamas listening out there that it really does make a difference. And I love the fact that it wasn't this structured, let's teach them a life skill. It was very much organic and that the sisters are the ones that connected that you all just sort of fell into this and then kept it going, which to me begs the question. Well, first I I must say, I think that's what's so endearing about you guys. That is not intimidating at all. And it's usually with ingredients you have right in the house. So it feels so doable. It's like, oh my gosh, dinner, I got to get it ready. And oh, I can go on and find something. I've got chicken, I got vegetables, right? So I love this idea of it being very connecting and resonating. So that's how it looks and seems and everything that feels on the back end. Take us to the back end because you've got six different sisters, personalities, schedules, right? You must've seen pretty quickly how this needed to start being divvied out because it was probably starting to get traction. And then you're like, okay, this is a thing now, people. How did you kind of make that transition from hobby fun to we need to look at this as a business and make this really fly? It was a lot of trial and error. And to be totally honest, it probably hasn't become as structured until the last four or five years. It took us a long time to kind of figure out that some of us have different strengths and different weaknesses. And one sister is so good at coming up with brand new recipes. Another sister is really good at going to a restaurant and trying something and kind of tweaking it. And some sisters are really good at baking. But I think when we really realized like this could actually be something that provides for our families. And this is something more than just a hobby. We're like throwing up there. And I think when we finally realized we want to take this to the next level and we want this to be something, we love it. I think that's what makes it something we're still so passionate about is we didn't start this as with the mindset of, okay, we're going to make a ton of money and we're going to have a business and we're going to be successful. Like that was not it. Clearly we had no idea what we were doing. And so I think once we got serious about it and kind of put some structure in it, luckily all of us are pretty laid back and pretty chill. (laughs) So a few of us with stronger personalities were able to kind of say, okay, this is what we're going to do. You're going to do this. Every sister is going to do this. We're all going to help with this while some like kind of just divvying it out based on what we were good at and what we were passionate about so that we would not get burnt out. Um, and that's been something that's really, really helped is, is recognizing what, what we're good at. 
I adore that because when everybody don't, are we just listening and going, Oh, how I wish that I had five sisters that we could all take a piece of this pie. Right. And, and wear one of the hats. And I love the respect and the genuine care that you can feel between all of you, that there is this, it doesn't sound competitive or someone wants to be in the spotlight. And I love the genesis of it, where you say that the idea behind this is we just wanted to share and connect. And isn't that the ultimate core? I just, even anything that somebody does as a business. And I love too, that you had to put on that business hat to learn those skills. I remember years ago being at a writing conference and one of the agents said, there's two big circles. Imagine one circle is writing is your hobby and it's lovely and it's beautiful and it's unicorns. And this other one is it's a business and it's different skill sets, right? And the, the trick is to get that bridge of the love, keep the love and the passion and support it with the structure and the skill set. And that's what you guys have done. So as you've gone along, does it come to mind any learning curves that you remember being really hard, like kind of those burn the fingerprints off. Is there anything that comes to mind that you're like, we had no clue. And this is what happened. Probably when we first started teaching live events forever, we were able to kind of hide behind the computer screen or hide behind the laptops, just typing while our kids are like sleeping in the next room. And there have been some times where we've done like a TV segment or we're teaching at a conference or for like a church activity or anything like that. And we realize, oh, we forgot oven mitts. Like, how are we going to get, how are we going to get this out of the oven? And we've got to turn our jackets inside out and use the sleeves. Like just things you don't realize when you're when you're in front of a live audience, I mean, when you're cooking at home, it's totally different. You can throw stuff in, toss stuff in, sample stuff. And then we're cooking in public and we're like, oh, we forgot one of the main ingredients or we (laughs) forgot a whole recipe. Things like that can be so difficult. And, and having to feel like you have to memorize and show up with your best face on and your cooking caps on. I mean, it can get really tricky. And that's something we've had to learn to become comfortable with is, is being in front of people. I am a very introverted person. And I know a couple of my sisters are the very same. And so having to show up, whether it's live or even on social media, it's really hard to, to put yourself out there and to realize, okay, I can do this. It's only, it's only a couple thousand people, right? It's not that big of a deal. (laughs) But It's really scary. And that's not something that's gotten easier for me. So there's definitely been a learning curve with that. And most of it is coming to accept that it's okay to just show up however you are. I love that to just show up and be where you are and who you are. And I think people so respond to that because they know and can feel that you're not trying to put on a production. You're trying to teach a recipe. And I remember Julia Child, you know, they'd say that she would drop a chicken thing on the floor and she'd pick it up and just dust it off and be like, ah, we're good, we're good, you know? Right. And people loved her for it because she wasn't being, it was French cooking, it's so strict. And she was being so herself with it. I love that, especially for people listening. It's that fingerprint, that uniqueness, that personality that we bring to it. And here you guys have six different personalities. So is there any experience that you can recall, like a specific experience of a blooper or a thing that was funny or something that happened that you're like, Oh my gosh, we still talk about that. Oh my gosh. My, so I have a, at the time he was two. And so usually he takes a nap and that's when I try and get like all of my work done is when my kids are napping or at school. And I was making, I think it was like homemade pizzas or pizza boats or something like that. And I was doing it on, it was live TV on social media. I think it was on Instagram and Facebook. And so he was not sleeping. He, I could not get him to go down, but I had scheduled it. I was like all ready to go. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. I, this is how I cook at home anyway. Right. With kids running around right. my legs and you know, the bouncy so, seat right there. Yep. Yeah. I'm like, I got, I got this. It's fine. And so I start the recipe and he starts freaking out, throwing, throwing a tantrum, which is fine. And I'm trying to like manage it while dressing. I mean, on our Instagram and our Facebook lives, we get a lot of people coming on and asking questions and I'm trying to balance everything. And so he, he grabbed a kitchen chair and he pushed a chair over it and stood up next to me and was trying to help me. So I was like, okay, this is fine. He can help me cook. And I didn't notice it until I rewatched the video later, but every time I would turn around, he would take a huge handful of cheese and just shove it in his mouth, like huge handful of cheese, like a half a cup of cheese every time. But I was so 
so worried about like answering the comments, making sure he didn't fall off the chair, making sure the recipe got done. Like I just didn't notice. And so the whole time, no one's paying attention to anything I'm cooking. Everyone is like, is he okay? Is he eating? Can he eat this much cheese? And I just, oh my gosh, we still talk about it. My husband will still send me clips of him just shoving cheese in his mouth because my husband's watching it at work. Like you should probably get him down. (laughs) And I still... I had some, I took me a while to get back on with kids ever awake, but. Oh, that is so great. It's just real life. You know that, I mean, that's what happens when I cook dinner at home anyway. So it was just the whole world got to see it that day. (laughs) And I bet they were laughing so hard and totally could relate because this is, and I wanted to, this beautiful segue into this of balancing as a mom. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about when I do my studio five segments, I had to get my little guy asleep. I'd give him a sucker, get him asleep at the point of the mountain, have a friend in the car. I'd pick her up at Draper, go drive. I'd park in the front thing, run in, do my segment. She's sitting with him. He's still asleep. Come back in, start driving back down. And he'd wake up right at the point of the mountain. And then we go to lunch. Like I don't think men understand when you have children or men that do, you know, that have children, they understand that there's so much choreography. And just like you said, there's radar all over the place while you're trying to do stuff and then still show up for the people who wanted to hear what you have to say. So have you found any mom, I call it mom and any mom and life tips that have been helpful for you? Maybe just one tip that comes to mind. That's like, this has really helped me to be able to keep that mindset balance or actual physical balance on being a mom man? Yeah, I am someone who works so much off our routine. We do, we do the same thing every day. We wake up, we get ready for school, we go to school, you know, those types of things. I thrive off of that. And so do my kids. And so something I've learned is to have set times of my schedule that are also routine that I'm not on my phone or I'm not working. And I, as hard as it is when you're working for yourself and you're working from home, I try my best to, to clock out and to say, okay, from this hour to this hour, mom is working. And then that's when I try and get it all done. So that while I might not be hundred percent there for my kids during that time, I can focus on work so that I am a hundred percent there at another time. And, and trying to figure out that balance has been really hard, especially as things change and new babies come. And it's always just it's always kind of a juggle, but having that hard stop of work and mom is something that's really helped me kind of feel like I'm managing and giving my best effort in both areas. Cause it's a, it's a lot, it's a hard balance. And I don't know if there's a, if anyone has mastered it, I would love to hear from them. So (laughs) let me know. But as far as, as trying, that's something that's worked the best for me. I so love that you shared that. And I think balance is that sort of daily balance, right? Being able to see what, who needs what on that given day, but making sure you're hitting the four five, six core areas every day so that you know that over a course of time, you're really feeding those things that need to be fed. And I love President Nelson. I love that their family kept saying when he was home, he was home. So I don't think they minded when he was gone so much in the sense that they knew they were going to get a piece of him when he came in the door and he was very present. I was just reading the other day how he'd come in and start changing diapers and he was right there with them. So I love that. So let's kind of segue on to if, as you're moving forward, you're doing this and it's starting to grow and it's, it's becoming a thing. Was there ever a time that you felt like this is beyond us? This, this is too much scale. This is too much scope. I don't know if we can continue this and, and do we need to bring in help or how, how do we navigate this up level where even after you've made the decision to take this big, then there's always the, the scaling up levels where you're like, whoo, excited and scared. Were there any moments like that? And how did you handle them? Yeah, I think some of those moments even just looked like the self-doubt. Like I said before, we're not professional cooks. And so to have these moms who, when I was younger and a newlywed, a lot of these moms had like five or six kids and I didn't have any. And so they're asking me all these questions and I'm like, I am not, I can't do this. I can't, yeah, I can't teach you how to do this. And so there was a lot of self-doubt and a lot of that imposter syndrome, I think that comes with showing up and trying to teach, whether you're teaching anything creative or whatever it might be, there's always that feeling of, I don't know if I'm the right person to teach them how to do this. And so kind of jumping over that hurdle was a huge thing for us. Once we decided, okay, we're going to take this to the next level. We need to accept that we are capable of teaching this. Like we're doing it ourselves. Like we can teach this and we can show people and we can help people. 
Um, and then it kind of came down to, okay, but how much do we want to invest in this as, as moms, how much time can we, can we put to this? And we've been super blessed and so lucky to have a lot of other moms that work with us and help us and their moms too. And they are able to work from home and we're able to provide jobs for them so that they too can provide for their families. And so it's been also a learning curve. I mean, as someone without a business background to realize, okay, I need help with this. I, someone else can do this job for me better than I can. And so accepting that and handing that off kind of feels like handing off a child. I mean, you spend so much time building it and creating it and then being willing to hand it off to someone is a little bit difficult, but just understanding they're capable too. I'm capable and they're capable too. And so that was something that was hard for us, but something that we've really had to work on. And as we grow, it's something that's become a little bit easier and to be able to help other women and other people who are wanting to work from home and have these resources too. It's been kind of a cool thing to see happen. And yeah. I love that. And the joy that you get from being able to help other moms spend that time at home with their kids instead of them being out in a way they're there when kids come home, they're there during the day. If if they get calls and things like that, I just think that's marvelous. So as we, you kind of were going down and you've done this food blog, you know, I want to bring it to the point of, then it starts to expand and you have all these, you know, irons in the fires and the fingers in the pies. Let's use that analogy, but you got all these fingers in the pies. So Tell us how that's kind of worked for you, because I know you started, you did cookbooks and put those out and then you started a podcast and then you have the table talk with moms and then you have the spark up podcast. Tell us about those and and what that, what need that's filling. Yeah. So as we started going around and like I mentioned before, kind of going to events and meeting all of these women in real life the comments weren't so much about the recipes anymore. They started being comments of, oh, you helped my family so much, or sorry if I get emotional, but seeing these other women and moms, oh, I'm so sorry, pregnancy hormones, find confidence in themselves as they're able to provide for their families in a way of, of gathering their families together. And so it was probably about two years ago our family had gone through some kind of difficult times and we just realized we would not have been able to get through that without each other, without each other as sisters and hearing these other women talk about the hard things they were going through and difficulties they were having in their families and how grateful they were for not only our recipes, but that we were showing up. We just realized, okay, what got us through our hard times? It was each other. It was having women supporting us, having other women in our corner. And so that's kind of where the idea came for the podcast. It's called Table Talk for Moms. We just sit around the table, (laughs) basically, and we just chat and we chat about mom life and struggles that we're having. And we open up about mental health and other things that we're dealing with and things that have to do with motherhood and being a woman. And it's been so cool to see those same people who love our recipes come and just also find support in motherhood in other ways. Cause we can, we can pump out recipes all day. I will cook all day. That is not a problem, but it's been so fun and just such a whole new outlet to have a place where I can show up and not have to worry about oven mitts or cooking or those types of things and just come and be myself and be a mom. Cause that's, that's who we are first and foremost is we're moms too. And that's, that's why we have this whole company, this whole platform, six sister stuff is based off of the fact that we are moms trying to help other moms. And so table talk kind of just came in there and it's, it's been a great fit. It's been perfect. And we've had so much fun connecting with other women in this different way. So we love it. I love it. So fabulous. And I'm loving this thread that just keeps weaving through it of, we just do what we love to do and we're letting the chips fall where they may and the dominoes fall. Right. And then one thing's leading to another, to another, because you've established that trust and you have excellence in something you're doing. And then you're being able to say, here's an effective way to share it. And these are all pieces for those that are listening that are so vital to anything that we want to share and contribute with others. And And I've seen, I've watched you guys over the years and how it's just sort of now this traction with what you're doing with social media and all of those things. And you have another podcast, Spark Up Podcast. So 
what, what have you found have been some of the most important things that you've done with social media to create that traction? Because there's so many people listening and I know that they are, have this love hate relationship with social media of, I don't want to do it. I don't even know if I have to, but I think I do, but I don't know how to go about it. Any thoughts on that of these are some things to consider when you're doing your social media to share. Yeah. I think the first thing that I always say to anyone who's looking for help with social media is to not take your starting point, the point where you're at, what you're creating, what you're doing, whether you're posting one time a week or seven times a week, don't compare what you're doing to anyone else in your field because they have different schedules. They have different passions. They have different followers who might engage more or you can't compare your before to their after. You don't know how hard they've been working on this, how long they've been doing this. And I think sometimes, especially in social media, it's so easy to fall into that comparison game of, well, they have this many followers, so they're probably making this much money or they're probably doing this much. Like It's so difficult to not fall into that, especially when you're seeing it constantly on social media. And so my number one tip is to just show up however you can. If that's once a day or once a week or twice a week, just whatever you can handle, show up however you can, but keep it consistent. So if you're going to show up three times a week, show up three times a week and, and really be there, show up and show behind the scenes, show what you're doing, share what you're passionate about and don't do what everyone is saying you need to do what you have to do. Don't worry about the trends. Don't worry about the audio that you need to be using. Just show up and be consistent. And your followers are going to see that and they're going to notice that and it's going to attract new ones and people who are there because they genuinely like you. And those are the people who are going to turn into customers or people who support you and are proud of you and excited for you and your growth. And yeah, I think that would be There's a lot of things I would suggest, but that's probably the number one thing I would say is to just do what you can and don't worry about what everyone else is doing. That is so key because that comparison, I know Eleanor Roosevelt says the thief thief of joy, and it really is. Mm -hmm. It takes all the wind out of your sails and the motivation and the passion and the desire because you're like, somebody else is doing it so much better. What do I have to offer? Right. Mm -hmm. And it goes right down with that imposter syndrome and all that. When all we're asked to do is stay in our lane and offer our own fingerprint of what we bring to the table on this particular thing. Absolutely love that. Has there been a situation or something as you've gone along that you felt you had to maybe be more open or vulnerable than maybe you had wanted to be, but it turned out to be a good thing? There's a lot of times that I'm talking to creatives and they're like, well, I'll put this out there, but I don't really want to share a lot of me because if it fails, that means I'm a failure, right? But has there been an opportunity for you to grow or be more vulnerable and it turned out to be a good thing? Totally. Just a couple of months ago, actually, on this podcast that we started. So we were still kind of getting used to showing up without food as our shield, but we can't really hide behind it anymore. Like we have to show up with our voices and come up with things to actually say instead of one cup of this, two cups (laughs) of this. And so we were kind of planning out content. And one of my sisters was like, Hey, would you? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to cry again. She's like, would you talk, come talk about anxiety? And as a mom who sorry, has struggled with mental health, it was so scary. Oh my goodness. I can't even begin to tell you how scary it was, but her and I have very similar experiences of anxiety and postpartum and things like that. And so we, we've recorded a podcast episode kind of diving into that and what has helped us and signs that we notice and things and what we've used to go through it. And I'm sure you've had podcast episodes like this, where you can't listen to it. Once you've published it, you edit it, and then you put it out there and you turn off your computer and you turn off your phone and all your notifications and And it was was one of those, like, yeah, it's just terrifying, you know, something you've never, what did I just do? Yes. And now it's like, I can't take that back. So it was really scary. And and I'm sorry, I got emotional about that, but it was terrifying and it was not something. I mean, these people have watched us for years making slow cooker recipes and soups and all these things. And they have no, they don't know 
me like that. And so it was really scary, but we got so much feedback from moms and from other women who were experiencing that and who maybe were even experiencing it and didn't know what to call it or or how to cope with it or how to deal with it or feeling like they couldn't talk to anyone about it. And so that was kind of the turning point for us when we realized, okay, like this podcast is more than just another outlet. Like this this can really help people. And so we started bringing on professionals and other people who could help with, with those types of things and other subjects and other topics too. But that was for sure one of those times where it was really scary and it was really hard, but was totally worth it. And it totally changed the projection of where we took that podcast. And we actually had been calling the podcast something else. It was called Around the Kitchen Counter is what we had called it initially at the beginning. And after that episode and a few other episodes, we realized, no, this is for moms. This is for moms. And so we changed the title to Table Talk for Moms so we could really focus in on on that group of women who we felt called to help. So, and I love what you just shared. And I love the tears because you can tell it is so resonant and so passionate and so scary because so many of these things really are. And I think sometimes creatives look at people who are successful and think they don't have to deal with that. They just had some gene that they were able to just move through it, but it is, there's private battles that are being waged all the time. And I love that you said that calling, because that's a beautiful segue for us to wrap up in this call to create podcast. I think the things that you have shared have been so fantastic, Lauren. And I love that last point that inadvertently you shared shared as far as another tip of being yourself and showing up like that without apology, without shame, without regret, but showing up and being your full self. Is there, as we've talked today, we've had so many good things. This is such a keeper episode. Is there any last bit of advice or a thought or something that keeps you going or an an ism that you say to yourself or something that helps you as you go through all of the ins and outs of this? Is there any one last thing that you'd like to share with the listeners? I think the quote that I just always turn back to, and I'm totally going to butcher it, but it's just that quote that says, like, no one else is better at being you than you are. And so whatever it is that you are called to do or whatever it is that you're passionate about and that you want to do or that you feel like you can share, just do it. There's no one else that can do it in the way that you're doing it. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to do it perfectly. But if you feel called to share something, if you feel like you have a message to share, there's probably a reason why you're feeling that calling or why you're feeling like you need to share it. And it's terrifying and it's not easy, but even if you could help one person, it would be totally worth it. I always like to, when you get down about numbers, when you're tracking your social media or website views or purchases or whatever it is that you're tracking. And it's really hard to see like, oh, only one person saw this or only one person liked this comment. To picture yourself in a room with that one person or those 10 people or even those 100 people and imagine if you could help them in real life, if you could help them face to face and it makes everything like that perspective just completely changes everything. And so that's kind of what I've tried to take on while we're podcasting and while we're making these recipes and, and it's really helped us to envision just the one person we actually, we call her Susan. And every time we, we get on to cook or make a recipe or do whatever we think, okay, what does Susan need? What does Susan need today? And that's who, that's who we talk to. And it just, it changes everything. Once you have that one person that you're helping, if you know, you can help one person, it makes whatever you're doing totally, totally worth any time or any work you're putting into it. That is so fabulous. And you are not going to believe this. I have this book of a woman that that's the woman that's the, you know, kind of quintessential of who I'm trying. My name is Susan. That is what it is called. I cannot believe, but I love that. And I love that you emphasize the called that called part. And no, we did not pay her for any promotional thing on calls to call degree, <laughs> but you're so spot on that when you feel called to do something, you can 
go into those hard spaces and scary spaces and take that next right step and know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where he's taking me, but I trust him and we can do this. And if it's for him, then it's all going to work out in the wash. And I love that faith that you and your sisters have had and the absolute joy and blessing that you are to so many. Lauren, thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's been pure joy. Thank you so much. This was awesome. We, I loved being here. So thank you so much. And for those that want to reach you because they're going to want to, what is the best place to find you? You can find us at six sister stuff.com. Or if you want to come check out the podcast, it's called table talk for moms and it's available anywhere. You can find podcasts. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. This was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody listening. And as always, if you have loved this interview and you want more of this good stuff from our other guests, Steve Young, Lisa Valentine Clark, Jenny Oaks Baker, Gerald Lund, so many amazing people all helping you on your journey, then go below, rate, review, and subscribe. We would love to have you get more right into your inbox as well. We would absolutely love to continue helping you take your next right step in being called to create.